Okay, so um, I've been working on these two three foot by six foot panels and currently they're, they obviously look like they could go together, but uh, they don't have to stay together. And the only difference between the two, as I was putting on the collage paper, is that with this one, I started going from kind of laying down the thicker things and then went thinner as I went to the top um, surface. So I started with more book covers, paperback book covers, because they are the thicker paper. And I guess part of the reason I was thinking was that when I sand back, you know, it's easier to go through the thin stuff on top and then work your way down to the bottom. And also putting the thin on top of the thick helped me to make sure that the entire surface of the thicker papers, like the, the paperback book covers can be kind of bumpy and they needed more uh, of the gel medium to make sure that they'd lie flat. So by putting the thinner things over the thick, I think that helped it for adhesion purposes. Now, so I'm gonna hang this on the wall and you'll be able to see them together. I just have to decide, not that it really matters, but kind of what side I want to go up. And I started to, um, let me just clean this up first. Okay, so they're not very heavy. And they're just gonna hang side by side here. Um, I'm just checking warpage as well. I mean, it's a little bit, I'm not sure if it's my wall. It, it's also partly the paper um, that goes along the edge. So a couple thoughts I had were that, number one, I could do some light sanding first. I still may do that, I'm not really sure. And today outside is kind of cold and I was originally gonna do all my sanding outside because then you don't really need a mask and, and all that. But if I do it inside the studio, then I want to be wearing at least um, a particle mask. It doesn't have to be a respirator, but um, you really don't want to inhale those particles. So the uh, advantage of being outside is you don't have to be quite as careful, but I probably would still wear a mask even if I did outside. And then I can either use a hand sander or an orbital sander. Um, the orbital sander is more heavy handed and um, even though it has three different settings on it, you know, from like slower speed to high speed, you still have, you're going to take up a lot more material than if you use a hand sander. So, um, in addition to that possible, you know, question in my mind, like whether I should sand first and then put the paint over the surface, the other idea I had was to use some of this green painter's tape as a resist because um, after I put the paint on and after I sand it back and after I start to do some other things to the surface, it's, it's very like you don't know what you're going to get. That's for sure. So by using tape as a resist, then I'm able to like decide small portions of this entire piece that I kind of want to show through. Um, before I go over the surface with paint. I'm just gonna cut these. And I have some thicker ones here. So let me just start by grabbing. I'm not, you know, again, I'm not planning this. I'm just gonna stick these on here very randomly and press down firmly. And again, I want a big difference between like thick and thin. So I might tear this one down down the middle if I can. I'm not sure how I can tear this. Or just have an unusual shape. All right, that's different. So this one. I guess the good thing about the green tape is on a busy background like this, you can actually really see the tape. Um, this just has a tiny little tail. So I know you can't see that very well, but you will see it when I uh, progress through the painting. It's hard to know what I'm actually doing. I know that. It's hard for me to know what I'm doing half the time. I'm going to keep tearing this guy all the way down. So 
So that's the strip that I have right here. Just, I just want to show you the like difference in edge quality here. You can see that the top is torn and then the bottom is a rectilinear edge. So that's what I want you to see, which I, I'm pretty sure you can't see that from where I'm at. Um, I'm going to come down here now, and again, it's just all approximate. I'm not measuring anything, as you can tell. Um, let's see, one thing I do want to establish, though, is like one, two, how many rows I want. So this will be like three. So, like, there's Snoopy, and I have to be really careful to um, cover him up. Like, you don't want to have anything really recognizable that is not, that's copyrighted. That would be copyrighted. <laughs> Things like scrapbook papers are not copyrighted, or anything like uh, decorative papers, you know, they're not copyrighted. So, you just have to know what is copyrighted and what is not copyrighted and then just make sure that whatever is copyrighted that you cannot make that out in your final piece. That's really important. Not that I mean, you know, if you had a little bit, it's not like somebody's going to actually see your painting, but just as a precaution, you might as well be safe. All right, so that's, that's that grid. And... Uh, I know you can't see it too well, but hopefully you can just see the process. And this grid will tie the two panels together. Even if they hang separately, um, you know, in the gallery or whatever, it would be fine. They would have, you know, they would speak to one another, either close in close proximity or far away. It doesn't really matter. But I can envision these hanging um, next to one another. Of course, it's too early to tell. You can see that um, I've got this, and then this doesn't quite line up with that, and then it scoots over that way because I've got a drawing there that I'm trying to um, preserve a little bit of. So it doesn't really matter if they, if the grid lines up, you know, exactly over. It's probably better if they don't. So more variation. And then because I've gone closer here, I can actually go further away or just uh, This one had drawings, and that one I don't think had any because I didn't uh, just didn't think of collaging the drawing. Make this look like row number four. very well. So I'm going to do a close-up with my other camera and hopefully that will help. Um, that shows you the tape. Kind of a grid, very loose and trying to vary all the strips and their length, their width, and their edge quality. Here's the left panel where I was not thinking about putting thinner papers over 
the thicker paint uh, papers. And then on this panel, I did just as an experiment. And you'll see ledger paper. Uh, you'll see a lot more of my contour drawings that I did at home based on things that we have there. Um, notice that if there is something I drew, I tried to concentrate some tape over it. I didn't do it with the skull, but <laughs> and that, that skull was um, a ceramic that we got that I got from an artist, um, Omar Hernandez in Oaxaca. Um, okay, so there's the tape. You can kind of see it going over the surface. And my next step is to make sure that the tape is really um, pressed down because I'm going to cover over both of these panels now with paint. Let that dry and then come back in and pull the tape off. It will be a lot of fun. Thanks everyone. Okay, so that's the next step here um, in the life of this painting. Um, thank you for joining me and I hope you'll tune in the next time I show you the next stage of this video. I just finished putting on all the screen tape. It's kind of a loose grid and I'll just uh, hold this up a little bit so you can see it. But I showed this in another video. Um, even if you can't see it, don't worry. It'll show up more after the next thing I'm going to do, which is to coat the entire thing with some high key, meaning light, paint, acrylic paint. So this is going to be an acrylic painting. Um, I'm gonna really make sure the tape is firm and flat and no air pockets. Um, it's being used as a mask or a resist to the paint. Okay, and I have another panel behind me uh, so you can kind of see what that looks like. And again, it's just a very loose grid. And I'm gonna just take this acrylic paint and I've got my floor covered with plastic which I'm tripping over, which is always nice. And um, I'm going to um, add the paint. All right, so I've got this paint tray. I'm just gonna move it over here. And I'm using um, a sponge roller so that it's just, it goes faster. And I also have collage paper on the sides, so I have to make sure I get the sides as well. But using the sponge roller, it should be easier and faster than using a brush. And I don't really want the brush strokes, so I'm just going to go over this. And I want it, you know, I want it thick enough that I can't really see the tape all that well. That's how I'll know that it's thick enough. So I'm just gonna systematically go over this. Something really satisfying about obliterating all this noisy stuff underneath. As interesting as it is, it's not, definitely not anything that I'd want to leave that way, but it's a great way to get started. There's so many ways to start a painting and I had all this paper just laying around in the studio and I figured, well, why not just throw it on? You know, this idea of things having to be so permanent and archival, I don't, some of the artists I really admire, like Mark Bradford, who I already mentioned, look up his work and again, he makes his large scale, very large scale work from garbage that he picks up on the street and I read that if he can't find his art materials at Home Depot, he doesn't use them. And that's just a different contemporary attitude, but I tend to really feel like that's where we are right now. Like I feel like the way our world is going, the way our environment is being destroyed and you know, global warming and, and everything that's happening, Sure, you could worry about all those things, but I just feel a great sense of impermanence right now in my lifetime, and I feel like this kind of expresses it, so I'm not gonna worry if my painting doesn't last for 3,000 years. I'm gonna use what I have, and artists throughout history did that. It's up to you how thickly, if you try to do this, if you want to put it on more thickly, you can. Um, just gonna put on a little bit more here. And you know, the nature of a sponge brush, it is a little tacky and I'm not sure I like that. So I might come over this with a, um, 
a silicone tool just to smooth things out a little bit. Not quite sure yet. And actually, I'm not going to worry about the tackiness of the sponge roller because um, if this remains an acrylic painting, which, you know, it may or may not, it may turn into a cold wax and oil painting, I don't know. But if it did stay an acrylic painting, I've got this uh, method of using pouring medium and you would never see. Plus, you know, after I sand it, you're not going to see it anyway. So what was I thinking? Yeah, this will be fine. Um, I think I'm going to try and see if I can move this and put it somewhere and then work on this panel. So this one was done a little differently in that when I laid the papers down, I do remember that I started with thicker materials like paperback book covers and I tried to go from thick papers to thin. I'm not sure if it makes any difference at all, but maybe when I sand back is when I would notice if there is a difference. And you don't have to use high key paint to cover the whole thing. You can use whatever value that you want. But um, since I will probably not have a whole lot going on on these paintings, and um, I'm going to feature my midtones and my darks, and most of what's on here right now, would, I would say, is probably midtone with some dark. And yeah, of course, there's some light, but I mean, the whole point of this, covering this all up, is that I have control over what values I want to feature. And it's all about value. As you can see, the magazine papers are every color under the sun. I'm not worried about harmony right now because this painting is just getting started. And when you cover everything up, with whatever color you choose, you just harmonize it anyway. So this white is actually serving to harmonize all those busy colors. You could take this and rub graphite powder over the entire surface. In fact, that would be very cool to try. Hmm, maybe I should try that. Let's see, how would that work? Because um, I do this in encaustic a lot. Um, just rub graphite powder and then it goes black. And then you can rub most of it away Normally I would use cooking oil on an encaustic, but um, on an acrylic, I'm not sure I'd want to use cooking oil. You could probably use water. Probably just water would take off the excess. Um, I'd have to try that. I'm not really sure of the best way to do that, but um, that would be fun to try. And that would then, like if that was the only thing you did, you would be featuring your texture. And it would just be a really cool, you know, no two pieces would ever be alike. But it would go, um, it would dirty up the surface and you don't have to lift it. You don't, wouldn't have to lift the graphite powder. You could have it be really thick, but then you'd have a really dark, well, you'd have kind of a mid-tone, a dark mid-tone painting. All right, that's a pretty even coat. I don't see any colors except for here because I didn't cover this up yet. I'm hoping for a nice weather tomorrow so I can sand these outside. I really don't want to have to sand inside the studio if I can help it because I don't want all this um, white, titanium white um, dust flying around. I mean, I'll be wearing a mask, but still not a good thing to inhale. If you do it outside, you know, you probably could get away with not wearing a mask. Okay, it's pretty even now. Don't see any color below. All right, everyone, I think that's it. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time when I get out my sander.